In this segment, we're going to talk about truth, objective truth versus subjective truth. And if there's any topic that's really close to my heart, this is certainly one of them. It has been for a long time, and as we're going to see, this really gets to the heart of what is going on in our culture. Let's dig in. Quoting from John 14, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now listen please to this one, everybody's favorite book, Leviticus. <laughs> Please listen to it carefully as it relates to the concept of truth, the common notion of truth being relative and subjective as opposed to what the Bible teaches it being objective and absolute. So listen to this. Leviticus chapter 4, um, verses 13 and following. If the whole congregation of Israel sins. Did you hear that? If the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly and they do not and they, excuse me, and they do any one of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done and they realize their guilt when the sin which they have committed becomes known, the assembly shall offer a bull from the herd for a sin offering and bring it in front of the tent of meeting. And it goes on in more detail as to what to do about that. We'll talk about that more uh, shortly. Then quoting from John 17, verse 17. Jesus said, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. You're probably aware that recently there were two very unfortunate deaths, suicides. Um, Anthony Bourdain, uh, the food, food critic, and Kate Spade. Uh, the designer, both of them committed suicide, and this is tragic, very sad, and both seem to have it all, and in the relative prime of their life, they both left behind young teens, and Anthony Bourdain said in his note um, that he did not see his body as a temple, but as a funhouse. Uh, you know, according to what we talked about last time, being made in God's image, uh, he was meant for so much more than being a fun house. We are made for God. You know, in a way, I guess I can relate. Uh, when, I could, in one way, I'm the same age as Bourdain, um, but when I was a depressed 17 year old, I was suicidal and I was very close to, um, to uh, committing suicide. And it, it was only as I pondered what would happen to me after I died in the fear of what would happen to me after I died that dissuaded me from going through so, we, do, we are living, these uh, two deaths just remind me that we do live in deeply, deeply troubling times. Why is that? Well, going back to 1974, that's the year I graduated from high school. I, I doubt anybody would disagree with the following observation I'm about to make. The world is a much different place today than it was in 74. Something 
has gone wrong, terribly wrong. But that is, for, is as far as most folks will go, lamenting that something is wrong. But what? And I'm writing this because I care about the kind of world my children and especially grandchildren are going to live in. This world is in bad shape and it's a dangerous place. It is time to make a stand and to stand for truth. Many things could be said that are wrong about our culture, but chief of them and the fountainhead of all the rest is a radical shift in the concept of truth, which has occurred in my own lifetime. So much has happened since 74 about the notion of truth. I cannot sit back and watch our country slide into hell without doing what little I can to put up a fight. You know, 100, 150 years ago, our nation had a basically Christian consensus uh, or morals. But that has radically changed, especially in my own lifetime. To repeat, the most fundamental change, which has caused confusion across the board, systemically, is a radical shift in the meaning of truth. When I was in high school, if someone disagreed about religion, then there was a discussion over the evidence of over the truth or falsity of which view was correct. Truth at that point, as I recall, <laughs> that's a few years ago now, it was getting wob wobbly, but it still had legs, as unsteady as those truth legs were, to stand on. However, in just a few short decades since then, since then the notion has truth, of truth as truth has changed to where teens and young adults today, and older ones, now say that it's okay. You know, what you believe is true for you, and that what I believe for me is true for me. As long as you're sincere and it works for you, then it's true for you. As I recall, <laughs> if I was at a party as a teenager and somebody said that, folks would have said, man, you are drunk. You are drunk, boy. And we probably were. But that would have been, that would have been the reaction is just what we take for granted today the kind of changes that have happened in culture we get used to them like a fish in, in water and um, or the old analogy of the frog and the, um, the water is getting increasingly hot um, but this has been a radical shift that has uh, changed a great deal in our culture in just a few decades but really there is actually a long history of ideas behind what's happened um, in the last few decades that has led to this condition and that would include a guy named Immanuel Kant with his noumena phenomena distinction and Hegel with his notion of uh, synthesis of, of truth um, they both change the rules when it comes to epistemology, which is uh, how we know what we know in truth. But let me mention uh, Manuel Kant briefly. He lived in the 1700s, and he dropped a bombshell on the philosophical community. And almost everyone would agree that he changed the rules forever. In every university and college in our country, his influence is felt. The relativism regarding morals and religion is assumed. Okay? Why not math and sciences too? I mean, why, why, why is 
the relativism not felt in those fields as well? I and mean, why is 2 plus 2 still 4? Um, because Kant stated that it was in the area of morals and the transcendent, that is God, that we cannot have true knowledge. Okay. It's in those two areas with ethics and, and uh, theology that we cannot have true knowledge. We can have, you know, so that only in the area where uh, things can be empirically verified, the observable, the quantifiable reality that uh, can be spoken of meaningful, meaningfully. It was a, um, it was a small but fatal move to go from there to say that all religions are equally valid, and religious and ethical truth was a matter of opinion. Truth in those areas became subjective. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if that was Kant's uh, intent, but that's what uh, the noxious fruit was of uh, his, his teaching. It's actually kind of complex, so I hope I didn't make it too simplistic. You know, while the British invasion, you know, music was happening in the mid-60s, there was a simultaneous invasion of Eastern monistic thinking at the, uh, from the East via the Beatles and elsewhere. But it took a while, as it usually does, to trickle down to universities and then into the average person on the street where we live is a culture that is not only not operating on a Christian consensus anymore, in the area of morals and truth, but is now anti-Christian. Uh, keep your Christian morals out of the public life, and truth is truth. It no longer exists. Truth lies fallen in the streets. In a word, we have seen the relativization of truth in just a few short decades. A country was founded on the principle Listen to this, please, okay? A country was founded on the principle of equal toleration of all religions. And that's a good thing. You know, nobody's going to throw you in jail for your beliefs. You have the right to be wrong theologically. However, there is a small step in the mind, but it is a small step in the mind, but an exceedingly profound logical jump to go from equal toleration of all religions to equal validity of all religions. The Founding Fathers would have looked at someone today who spoke of equal validity of all religions as if they had lost their mind. And indeed, we have lost our minds. And it's because I love God and I care passionately about the kind of world my kids and grandkids are going to live in that I'm raising this issue and that we, we all need to do what bit we can. There has been an explosion of information on the web and folks do not know what is true or how to tell the difference between what's true and false. You know, once upon a time, you had to earn the right to be heard. But now anybody can write anything to anyone on the website. Just get it behind uh, um, anonymously, even on the uh, in in writing. People will read it, and um, they don't. Folks will read all this stuff, but don't know what they're what is true and what is false. We are addicted to always learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. A guy named Alan Bloom, a professor, wrote a book a while back entitled The Closing of the American Mind, in which he states that uh, there was one thing that he knew as a professor about all incoming freshmen, and that is that 90% of them believed that truth was relative and not absolute, subjective as opposed to objective. Friends, this is a horror of such profound proportions that it is unspeakable. Once absolute truth is denied, the basis for morals and meanings meaning goes out the window. 
You know, why not see your body as a funhouse if truth as truth is gone? A totally open mind which rejects objective truth plants both feet squarely in midair. The body is not a funhouse. It's God's image. And people have lost the basis for human dignity because of the loss of truth and its systemic effects. Why aren't the parents rising up in protest? Are, are we teaching our children and, and grandkids that truth is objective and preparing them to live in this insane world? If you ask the average person about their views of religion and their reply will be basically something like this. All religions are the same and whatever works for you is true for you. Now that's on a collision course with reality in a number of ways. First, relativism falls, falters on the rocks of self-refutation when it asserts that relative truth is true for everyone. What I would ask is, are you absolutely sure that relativism is true? Yeah? Then it's not relative. You're making an absolute claim that absolutes do not exist. You cannot live in God's world and think autonomously without your system or thought turning irrational and self-refuting. Because Christianity is not just sort of true, it's really true. True truth, as Schaefer put it. And truth is exclusive. Second, would you say that all you have to do is believe in believe sincerely with all your heart that 2 plus 2 equals to 5 and that would be true I don't think your teacher would uh, be too hip on that or would you with all sincerity in your heart if you believe that you could fly and if you jumped out of a 10 story building what would be the consequence well, both notions lead to absurdity even death. Why? Because all of our belief, no matter how sincere, is not going to change the laws of math or gravity. Think about it. If people would think about this concept of truth for five minutes, I'm, I'm convinced that they would see the utter absurdity of it. Similarly, people's belief or non-belief is not going to change whether the biblical God exists or not. He's either there or he's not, regardless of our belief in him or disbelief. Actually, it's quite arrogant to infer that we can cause something to be true simply because we believe it's true. This is kind of creation out of nothing in a sense. Thirdly, many uh, loving folks just want to believe that all religions are the same. They don't like judging others. Um, you know, please, to, to, to be honest, part of me wishes that all religions were the same. I mean that. But in order to do that, you would have to put your brain in a jar. And honestly, I do not want to waste my life believing in a lie. I have spent many years studying why Christianity is true and why other religions and philosophies are false. And I have what is what I call cognitive rest regarding the utter certainty that Jesus rose from the dead and that paganism, Islam, Buddhism, etc. are the lies of Satan. If I love someone, then I will want to pre prevent them from being harmed. And false beliefs harm people for eternity. Let me ask you this. Do you believe in the basic laws of logic? For example, the law of non-contradiction, which states that A cannot be non-A, at the same time in the same relationship. 
Because if you do, then you cannot embrace relativism. For example, it cannot be pouring down rain and not raining at the same time and in the same place. Or, I cannot be in Greensboro, North Carolina, and in Paris at the same time. That's just totally absurd. So why do we apply that same kind of absurdity to when it comes to religion? All religions are the same? Really? Do you realize that the world religions do not just differ over non-essentials, but hold mutually exclusive views of exceedingly important issues? The Bible affirms that God is Trinity. Jesus is God. The only way to heaven is through Jesus. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose from the dead. But Buddhism, New Age, Islam, Judaism, etc. deny all of these. Are you going to say that the Trinity exists and does not exist at the same time? Are you going to say that Jesus is God and not God at the same time? Are you going to say that he is and is not the only way to heaven? That he did die and did not die on the cross for our sins? That he did and he did not rise from the dead? Do you see how foolish and irrational that notion is? Many assert that there are many paths to the top of the mountain. But Jesus denies that when he says in the verse that I quoted, that I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And the same sentiment is expressed in Acts 4.12. For there's no other name that's given under heaven amongst men by which we must be saved. The infinite personal God of the Bible says that he is really there and that he has spoken true, objective, absolute truth to us. So increasingly, our culture is basing law on sociological averages and what the Supreme Court thinks that at that time is best for the most people, man's opinion. However, notice just how objective absolute truth is in that Leviticus 4 text is that I pointed out at the beginning. Just to remind you, it says that if the entire Israelite nation or country we're talking about every man, woman, and child. If they commit a sin, but the entire community is unaware of it, it still produces objective guilt before a holy God. This is an extraordinary text for our age, y'all, because it asserts that even if an entire nation unintentionally does something against God's commandment, God's truth is so true, so absolutely and objectively true, that they incur objective guilt before a holy God anyway. So much for the idea of individualized relative truth, huh? <clears throat> Which raises the question, from where does, does truth come? Well, ultimately, truth is rooted in the character of God, which we've been talking about, <clears throat> which in turn is expressed in his written word. We cannot get more fixed unchanging, absolute, and objective than God's character. And then that's the beauty of God's written word is 
God planned it so that we would have a permanent record, something in written form that we could have access to, ready access to, of his uh, absolute unchanging truth. When you affirm truth, then that necessarily implies non-truth or error. It just comes with the territory. And that in turn calls for loving confrontation. Though it's not politically correct to say that someone is wrong, no matter how lovingly you say it, we must stand for truth valiantly, or the next generation will be left in a dark wilderness of pain, lostness, and darkness. If you love someone, then you will warn them of danger, even if you know it may cause them f cause friction. Truth is by definition and necessity divisive or divisive. Jesus either is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody can come to the Father but through him, or he is not. But he cannot be both at the same time. It is madness of the worst kind that has deluded our culture. I tell you, I can see the footprint of Satan in this whole scenario. Because his first recorded words in the Bible are what? He's contradicting God, questioning the truthfulness of truth. Suppose that truth is subjective and relative, just for argument's sake. What are the consequences? First, even though we may be used to this notion, it just became popular mainstream in our generation. We lament that something is wrong. Almost everybody that I know would say that. Something wrong with our country. But <clears throat> then we balk at the notion of what is the primary cause of the current confusion, which is the jettisoning of <clears throat> the biblical God, the holy God. It necessarily entails that one cannot call any belief. This is one of the consequences of the relativization of truth. It necessarily entails that one cannot call any belief or action is wrong. Nothing can be said to be wrong. My last name, Hunemann, or Hunemann in Germany, is about as German as one can get. And I often wonder how and why the church and the folks in Germany do not speak out more against Hitler. But hear me well. If you believe that truth is relative and subjective, that it changes from person to person, situation to situation, then you have no basis for saying that what Hitler did was wrong. None. He sincerely believed that what he was doing was the right thing for Germany. The 20th century is the bloodiest in history. <clears throat> in all the cruel, cruel regimes, from Stalin to Hitler to Pol Pot, believed in relative truth. Over, in our own situation, over 60 million unborn babies have been slaughtered in the place that should have been the safest place for them, their mom's womb. We can't point a finger at Nazi Germany without seeing our own wickedness and neo-barbarianism, which is what this new truth leads to, the new barbarianism. What have we done to our children by bequeathing to them this horrid notion of truth? I'm by no means a perfect grandfather or perfect anything. But I want my kids and grandkids to know that I will fight bare knuckled over this issue because I don't want them to inherit the wind, a place where truth lies in a garbage dump of relativity and subjectivism. Part of me is terribly afraid. I don't know. I know ideas. I know the consequences. They get worse with each generation. And if we don't speak out against the rising tide of relativism, then we're accommodating this monstrous lie. 
And I don't want my grandchildren to say, Granddad was too busy and selfish to address the issues, connect the dots, or prepare us to think with biblical categories regarding truth. When Jesus said that he was the way, he was saying there is no other pathway to God but through him. When he said he was the truth, he was saying that he is truth, implying all other religions are false, demonic delusions. When Jesus said that he was the life, he was saying that he alone gives eternal life, and hell is the destination of all those who ignore or deny him. What is truth? Classically and biblically, there are three components that comprise truth. They're known as the correspondence, coherence, and the utility or existential aspects. What John, the apostle, would call in his epistles, walking in the truth. The word emet in Hebrew and aletheia in Greek mean essentially the same thing. <clears throat> but first, let me say this. Implicit in the notion of truth is the insistence that truth is exclusive. It differentiates between truth and error. Most of the New Testament epistles were written, at least in part, to correct false teaching with the objective absolute truth of God's word. Truth, by its very nature, is confrontational and divisive. Jesus came to bear witness to the truth as he is the embodiment of all truth. You can see this in Second John, where three times in two verses truth is referred to because in anticipation of his denouncement of the false teachers he was about to um, ex uh, address. Of course, um, the correspondence aspect of truth means that what the Word of God teaches, it corresponds to true states of affairs, as we would say in philosophy. In other words, what the Bible says, it corresponds to reality, whether it's in here or out there. You know, we should rejoice in that. that what the Bible says can and has been verified countless times through science and archaeology. Christianity <clears throat> is also a coherent system of truth. It's much more than a system of truth and doctrine, but it's not less. It is, a co it is coherent in the way it expresses its truth <clears throat> spread out over 66 books books in an amazing unity the coherence from genesis to revelation just reveals that the holy spirit is the primary author truth is coherent and not chaotic and irrational like demonic paganism which bypasses the mind and says look inside to the heart for truth which according to biblical categories is depraved and corrupt and lastly, as John says, we walk in the truth. <clears throat> There's an existential aspect, meaning that moment by moment, <clears throat> we know that the truth changes lives. It's changed mine, perhaps yours. And that the gospel meets, and only the gospel meets, all of our deepest needs. It tells us what goodness, truth, and beauty is. It tells us how and where the answers are to the deepest questions that man has. Meaning, where is history going? What is God like? Now listen, when we're talking about the utility of truth, or um, we're talking about that it works. Now, please listen to this, care this carefully, though. Christianity works 
because it is true. It is not true because it works. You see the difference here? Christianity is true because, excuse me, Christianity works because it is true. It's not true because it works. We're not taking some concept of truth and slapping it on the Bible and making it to see if it conforms before we see, uh, decide whether or not God exists or if his word is truth. No, <clears throat> we know that uh, God is true and his word is truth. And therefore, it works. You know, I saw some videos of young people in a survey regarding their beliefs about religion. And many said that they believed what they did because it worked for them. But if it didn't work for someone else, then that was not their truth. You know, we should weep for our young people. The situation is, it leaves me really without words. It is so absolutely horrendous what is going on in our culture regarding truth that the vast majority of our young people and perhaps you now most of middle-aged folks as well believe that truth is relative and subjective it originates from here inside and not outside of us in an objective absolute truth based on God's character and written in his holy word. Our country has had periods of mass unbelief before, but this is the first time ever that the very concept of truth has been turned upside down, inside out. We live truly in an Alice in Wonderland where words and truth have had their meanings altered radically. After truth has been slaughtered, the foundations are gone. What truly concerns, frightens me, and should all of us, is what is next. This is bad enough. But what is next? After we jettison real truth. My last point has to do with effective evangelism with those who have embraced this terrible notion. In what Francis Schaeffer called pre-evangelism, we do need to speak to folks where they are and address their views of truth and how it logically leads to a horror of great darkness in morals and meaning. And then after lovingly but firmly exposing, taking the shelter off of their head and exposing them to heavy weather, then by God's grace, then they may be open to bowing before the God of truth through the unchanging gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you that truth is unchanged and unchanging because as the God of truth, you are unchanged and unchanging. You are immortal, immutable, and God only wise. I pray that you might pour out your Holy Spirit upon the United States, upon the world, that we might experience both revival and reformation. For Jesus' sake, amen.